All right, the U.S. Civil War, published by GMT, designed by Mark Semenich. We're going to be playing this. I don't know how detailed I'm going to get into this game, but uh, I'm going to be playing the full campaign, starting off in 1861, going up until possible uh, turn 20, which would be 1865. Uh, that's if an automatic victory condition isn't met before then, however. Uh, we'll just have to see how that goes. Like I said, this is going to be the full duration of the Civil War here. And we're starting off in the very beginning. So the forces are rather limited across the map here. Uh, the highest concentration, of course, is going to be up around the, uh, the Washington, D.C. area, where you have General McDowell in command of a very large stack in Washington, D.C. And we have Beauregard down here in a fortified position, as well as Johnston right here in a fortified position. We have Union General Patterson in Harper's Ferry. And, uh, yeah, that's all the generals up there. Uh, we do have uh, McClellan in Pittsburgh. And... We have Polk down here in uh, western Tennessee, and Price for the Confederates, at, who has just taken over Springfield. Uh, opposing him is General Lyon for the Union, as well as Fremont, who is positioned in St. Louis. So those are the generals, but you can see the Confederates do have militia and some random SPs, some strength points or soldier points, whatever you want to call them, scattered around. The Union does have control of this fort down here in uh, southern Alabama. It's, uh, what is that? That's Pensacola. That's, uh, that's Pensacola, the, the town or the city. This is uh, Fort Pickens where this Union uh, SP is. So the Union has control of Fort Pickens. All the rest of the coastal forts are currently controlled by the Confederates. And we're not going to get into a whole lot of rule details here to start off with. I will do some examples of combat, some play-by-play, -play, some movement, explain some things with the naval system. I'm not going to be playing the advanced rules. I won't get into the reasons why. I just find it's a much smoother an intuitive game if you use just the basic rule system. Right now I have the garbage man out front of my house picking up the garbage, so it might be a little noisy right now. He'll pass. And uh, what else did I want to touch base on? So for the most part, I just do want to touch, uh, touch on the basics here. So you have the states, obviously, which were mainly involved, the majority of the Civil War, uh, took place within the confines of this current map right here. Uh, but there are, this is divided into three theaters, and you can't see it from far away, but you can see this red dotted line going up and up and up all the way to the top of the map there. That divides the eastern theater from the western theater. Now, you have one more theater, which is this area right here, and this is the Trans-Mississippi Theater. And the border, the uh, boundary between the Western Theater and the TM Theater is the Mississippi River flowing right up there. And that is what divides the three theaters of this war here. Uh, you do have many, many different rivers scattered all over the board. Uh, one thing that you might notice is kind of the gray outlines that look uh, suspiciously like state borders. That's because that's exactly what they are. They're actually much easier to see if you stand back away from the map when you're up close. Um, it it kind of lose that definition of those borders there, and it can get a little... Uh, a little hard to tell what's what. So if you're ever having trouble to tell what state is what, if you stand back away from the map, you can clearly see the outline similar to what's you're seeing on the camera right now. If you go in close, you kind of stay, you can see you start to lose those those uh, gray outline borders, especially the ones that are along the rivers. They're hard for some reason. They're harder to see when you're up close. So if you stand back, you can really see them a lot better. 
Uh, of course, we have uh, Texas right here, just a partial bit of it and with two off map hexes. And we have Louisiana right here. We have Arkansas and Missouri. And we have uh, Illinois, Indiana, and Ohio up there on the top. We have Kentucky, uh, Tennessee, uh, Mississippi. I don't know if I said Mississippi or not yet. We have Alabama, uh, Georgia, Florida, South Carolina, North Carolina, Virginia, and Maryland up there, a little bit of Pennsylvania right there in the upper, upper right corner. And then we have uh, West Virginia right there. Now, the Union states are going to be comprised of Maryland, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, and uh, those are the main Union-controlled states. Now, the, there are three border states um, which can switch sides throughout the game. They're the only states that can switch sides. Doesn't mean you can't capture and take under control the other states, but these are the only ones that you can get to actually join your side by uh, controlling them. So we have West Virginia, which is the first border state, and this starts under Confederate control. And then we have Kentucky, which starts as a neutral state. And then we have um, Missouri, which is the third border state, and that starts under Union control, although it's already been invaded by the South at this point. So that is, uh, oh, everything else obviously is a Southern controlled state, uh, which does include Tennessee and the remainder. Of course, we have the two main locations that this game revolves around, we have Washington, D.C. and Maryland, and then we have Richmond in Virginia. And those two locations are pretty much the objectives of the opposing forces to capture and take control of, and that will greatly uh, increase chances of victory by doing so. So, of course, if you are the Confederates, you want to make sure you hold on to Richmond. And if you are the Union, the federal forces, you want to make sure you hold on to Washington, D.C. at all costs. Uh, I will talk a little bit about strategy. Uh, we'll start off with the Confederates. The Confederates are spread very, very thin, and the forces that they do have concentrated are outnumbered to begin with. So let's start over in the uh, Trans-Mississippi Theater. We have uh, General Price right here, who is uh, currently has two strength points with him, and one point is equal to 5,000 soldiers. So he basically has about 10,000 soldiers with him down in Springfield, whereas Lyon also has 10,000 soldiers. He has two SP with him, but there's one right there that he can re reorganize and join with him give them 15,000 soldiers. We'll get into that in just a moment. I want to talk about the Confederacy. So for the most part, what the Confederates have to do is kind of bide their time in the very beginning. Now, you know, there are places where you do want to hit early and as quickly as possible, in my opinion. One of those locations being Kentucky. You really do want to kind of put the pressure on the uh, Federals early in the game and uh, allow uh, force them to react to you because if it turns into a thing where the confederates are reacting to the federals then you're going to have some issues with always trying to regain the initiative and in the attack as the confederates from my experience it is a quite limited experience i think i've played about five games of this two times was with the advanced naval rules and the other three times were basic uh, basic rules. Uh, full campaign, I've played a total of three times. This will be the fourth time. So, uh, for the most part, like I said, we have to, in the beginning as the Confederates, we don't have many options. Flat out, you don't. One thing that I found that you do want to do, uh, possibly, if you do want to fight some sort of delaying action in the Trans-Mississippi, you do want to entrench Springfield as much and as quickly as possible. And uh, possibly, if you have time, it depends on what Lion does, and more than likely you're not going to have the time to get a strength point from down here up and across the Mississippi and into Springfield to help him out. 
Um, it's probably not going to happen. Never does if Lion moves quickly, which uh, is always going to be the case. When I play the Union, I immediately reorganize with that extra strength point and I attack Springfield. Uh, the majority of the time it's a su successful attack. It can turn out wrong for the uh, Union, though, every once in a while. just depends on the die roll, of course. So that's your main focus right here is kind of sealing off or or one of my main focuses as a Confederate is kind of sealing off uh, the Missouri border and trying to delay them, the Union getting down into Arkansas for as long as possible. Uh, we do have a couple opposing forces here. I think I might be missing a general. I think I am missing a general there in Cairo. I'll have to find him. Who is supposed to be there? In Cairo. One great thing about this game is it comes with setup cards uh, for each scenario. On the Grand Campaign, you use the 1861 setup. And let's find Cairo here. There's Cairo right there on the left hand side, right there in the middle. And there is no general on Cairo. It's simply three strength points and a plus two entrenchment. So they do have about 15,000 uh, Union soldiers in Cairo currently, which. Uh, is not too shabby when you add it to with that uh, plus two entrenchment. Let me, there the focus goes. So we have General Polk here, which is not an extraordinary attacker. Um, you can see the three numbers there on the chit. It's not going to, it wants to focus, but it's not going to. So anyway, you can see the three numbers down there on the counter. Uh, you have the farthest left number, which is a zero. That's the attacking level of the zero. In the middle, I'm trying to get this thing to focus. There we go. So we have the far left number is the attack rating. The middle number is the defensive rating. And the far right number is the movement value of that general. And then you can see how many stars this general has, his level of command. That will make a difference in determining if there's multiple generals in the stack, who is the overall general, the overall commander, as well as it will determine how many troops, how many SPs that that general can command in his stack, basically how big his stack can be. Uh, so that's, that's basically the general counters. Uh, those are uh, pretty self-explanatory for the most part. It's nothing too complicated. It's not like a GBOH counter where you have 12 different numbers on them or uh, subscripts or any from ASL or anything like that. So they're very simple counters to read. Like I said, this is a very intuitive and easy to play game. Very easy to learn. Um, you know, it, it's I would consider it definitely a classic. And there's a reason it's in my collection. So uh, we will be using the updated second edition rules uh, as well as the play aid charts that were released by GMT, oh, I wouldn't want to say about three or four years ago now. And uh, so this is, there, this is on P500 and I am using the same rules and updated versions that will be released during the P500, uh, upcoming P500 by GMT for this game. I think it's due out in about, oh, probably about anywhere from nine months to 14 months would be my guess when they'll release it again. And uh, so back to the Confederate strategy, of course, we do not want to let them into Richmond, uh, or excuse me, into Richmond. We don't want to let them into Virginia. We want to hold as much territory in Virginia. Virginia needs to be our main focus of defense. We don't want any Union soldiers entering Virginia or capturing any of these resource objective points right here, uh, which will basically uh, harm our uh, war industry greatly. So we do have war industry and production points, which will help you build soldiers, recruit soldiers, do training. There's a couple different ways to do that. Uh, but for the most part, it's mainly going to be by your war industry which uh, for the Confederacy, all these little numbers around and these objective hexes um, give the Confederates build points when they own them. And when the Union takes them over, it gives them victory points and takes away build points from the Confederacy. So the Union really wants to take away as many of those as possible. 
So uh, in the beginning, there is a total of uh, 100 of these, by the way, across the entire map, there's a total of 100 in the southern states. And um, we can see right here, uh, Patterson has already taken over Harper's Ferry in West Virginia. And so they've already lost one. And Wheeling has already been taken over by the Union as well. There's a Union control marker in there. So Wheeling, West Virginia has um, taken over one. So that's two build points at the beginning of a game that the Confederates have already lost. So the starting build points for the Confederates are 98, which is kept down here on this uh, track mapper as many, many games have. So we can see the build points, the times 10. I just put it here. Technically, the times 10 should probably be in the nine, the nine for 90, you know, but I just put it down here for simplicity. And that kind of keeps this upper track clear because this is where the counters are going to get really busy at is this top track for the most part. So I put that down there just for uh, simplicity's sake. And then we have the one on the eight. So that's 98 build points. And uh, we do have one arsenal down here. I just put it there uh, because I haven't rolled for it yet. The Confederates start off with one arsenal, which is an extra build point, basically. And you roll for random placement on that. Actually, we can go ahead and do that now since we have it here. And we can go ahead and lay out, let's see the random states table. Here's the random states table right here. And uh, we roll 2d6. Have I got 2d6 around? I know I have them around. Let's see. So we have 2d6. We'll go ahead and roll. And we roll a 5. A 5 on the random states table is going to be South Carolina. So we can take this arsenal and we can put it any place where there's already a build point, a resource uh, or objective point. So Columbia has two points already. We'll go ahead and we will put it there. So the Confederates actually have 99 build points. Uh, you do not change. I'm going to actually put that arsenal on top of the militia. That way it's easier to see and we don't forget about it. You don't change the build points on this track because of arsenals. Uh, and I'll explain that later as we end the, end the turn. So uh, in the beginning, in this first turn of the game, 1861, summer of 1861, um, we don't play any of the earlier phases. We go straight to the action phase. And you, this is actually a phase that you do four times in a row. So each player is going to get four action phases where they die for initiative um, at the same time. And a difference is turned into action points. And each player will get to use those action points for that phase and, or that cycle. And then that happens four times and then the action phase is done. And then we would start off turn two, excuse me. So uh, we can talk a little bit about the Union strategy. The Union strategy, for the most part, I found best is, like I've already talked about and hinted at, is uh, to take Lion, regroup and gather that extra strength point, and immediately attack Springfield. If you can knock uh, um, uh, Price out within one maybe two turns and knock him out. Then the gateway into uh, Arkansas is wide open. You can go right down, take over Fayetteville, and go right on in, take over Little Rock, and then start hitting up other places in Arkansas. And there's not many uh, forces that are going to be able to oppose you. So as, like I said, this, this is kind of vital right in this first turn of the game, what happens in uh, Missouri. Very important. So the other strategy for the Union is uh, to take uh, McClellan and get McClellan down further into West Virginia, take over Grafton and Charleston, and uh, take away those build points from the Confederates. And that's going to control, once you do that, you're going to entirely control West Virginia as the Union player. Uh, the other thing you want to do, of course, is make sure that Washington is fortified. Right now you have an, more than enough strength points to uh, protect Washington as long as you are not going out and foolishly attacking these forces and losing the die rolls. If that happens, you're thinning out your soldiers. Uh, it, it might turn into a very bad situation. Usually what I do is I will start taking off, draining one or two strength points here and there, and I will ship them out overseas, and I will start invading uh, any places 
any coastal forts that are unguarded, landing them there, capturing that fort, and then marching into the nearest towns with uh, build points. And that's hurting the uh, Confederates even more. And I will do that all along the uh, southeastern coast and all along the Gulf Coast as well. Any place that you can pick off uh, with easy little amphibious raids as the Union player. That's what you want to be doing early on, early game, to uh, start chopping down those Confederate build points. Uh, other than that, that's about it. Uh, there are action cards here, and I'll talk about those as we use them. But one last thing to mention is the generals. And you can see here each turn has a full list of names. And this tells you who is uh, basically turn one, who's starting off in the game right there. And turn two, who's demoted, who's promoted, who's added, and who's removed. Uh, and that allows you to easily keep track of the historic record of when these generals are coming in and out. Like I said, it's a very intuitive game, very easy flowing, fast play for the most part. It's a great grand strategy game, simple and elegant at the same time. I can't stress that enough, but some people do complain about the uh, historical flow of generals, about the forced addition and removal of generals. For instance, uh, Stonewall Jackson, when he dies, you know, even if he doesn't die in game, he's still going to be removed uh, automatically. And, you know, that kind of uh, throws everything for a loop if, um, you know, people don't like that. But I think it works pretty good. I've experimented with one other player on kind of house ruling, you know, leader loss die rolls and, uh, you know, only losing leaders to death or whatever. And if it's after the date that they actually died in history, those leader loss rules are, are uh, you know, increased to a higher percentage chance, uh, chance etc. But overall, we found it wasn't worth it. And the game pl plays very, very well as is. So, you know, I like it. Some other people don't. You know, you can't please everyone. Anyway, that's about it, guys. I'm going to go ahead and start off turn one. And, uh, yeah, I'm going to do this intro as a separate video because we've already talked for about 25 minutes already, and the gameplay video is going to be long enough as it is. I'm sure that's probably going to be uh, an hour, hour and a half long um, as I consolidate it down as much as possible, as well as show you, give you guys some gameplay examples. So, uh, yeah, I'll put this up as a separate video. Anyway, guys, thanks for checking it out. I look forward to playing a game and posting it for you. See you guys later.